I've opened up SocrataExampleData.csv from that we downloaded earlier from the Socrata site. And this is what I see. So it should look very similar to what you have on your screen, even if you're working in Windows, the actual data should look very similar. And I'm, first thing I'm gonna do whenever I'm working with a brand new data set is I'm gonna make a working copy. That way, if I do something weird, if my machine crashes, if just something unexpected happens, I at least know I'll always be able to go back to the very original version and build back up from what I did. So I'm gonna go in here and save as from the file menu. And that's got me in the same folder where I downloaded this. And I'm just going to call this a working copy. And I'm going to save this as an Excel workbook because we're gonna start building in some formulas and things. And you can't, um, you can't save it as a comma separated value file after that and you don't want to. So now what I see here is four columns and it's kind of hard to read the headers. And so I'm going to expand those out so I can see what I'm working with. If I click in the upper left corner here and I double click one of the sides of the columns, it will expand all of the columns for me here. And so now what I'm seeing is household ID, which is some probably randomly generated number from the survey, the age of the building, and this header is actually very kindly telling me this is in months. Uh, you may or may not always know that about data when you, when you get them. The duration of the current tenancy in months, and smoke alarm, which is a binary value, true or false, whether one is installed. So that's pretty straightforward. And the other thing that I'm starting to notice when I look at this is I have a mixture of quantitative and qualitative data. And this is the kind of qualitative data that we can turn into quantitative measures, which is really nice. The other thing I'm noticing is these data appear thus far to be really clean. I don't, for example, have text values in what seems to be a numerical field or numerical values in what should be a text field. I'm not seeing weird characters that I don't know what they are that don't seem like they should be there. There's not missing values. So a lot of the things that you might you know, initially see in sort of dirtier data sets aren't really present here, which is nice. And obviously we've given you a really clean, manageable data set for this example. Along those lines, when I say manageable, let's just look and see how big this is. So if we scroll down, it stops at line 75. So we've only got 74 entries in this data set um, and the four columns. So now that I have a really high level picture of what I'm dealing with, I want to start to dive into understanding the values that I'm looking at. There's no negative numbers. I can see that already. So that's good because that would be really strange if we had a negative number for an age of the building, for example. But is the range of these reasonable? Does it make sense? If you live in, say, San Jose, California, you're not going to have really, really old buildings, for example. So let's take another quick tour of these data by sorting them. I'm going to select all of my data. I'm going to go into the data menu here. And the first thing there is sort, because it turns out that's something that people do a lot. So we're going to tell, OK, Excel knows that I have headers, which is great. So we're going to sort by a one column at a time to get a feel for our data. Let's sort by the age of the building from smallest to largest. Don't worry too much about these other, other options here. We're going to sort on the values that are present in that column. And it's going to show us here that the smallest value, so we have a six month old building. And if I scroll down, we go all the way up to a 432 month building. That feels pretty reasonable. We're not talking about something that wouldn't necessarily make sense in almost any city or town. And let's do the same thing for tenancy. Let's make sure we don't have, for example, tenancy that's longer than the age of a building because that would indicate that something's up with the data as well. So now we'll sort by duration of tenancy and let's see. So the shortest one is the same age as a building. And then if we scroll down again, we see that 240 is the longest sort of tenancy that we've got there. So those numbers seem to make sense. And now that we've done this sort of, you know, by visual inspection of the data, let's move really quickly to have Excel do all of that stuff for us in a really quick way. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the min age, and I'm just going to create a column for each of these functions that we're doing, the max, and I'm going to go back here and actually make that the max age. And then the next one we'll do the min tenancy, we'll do the max tenancy. All right. So these, now we're going to start introducing some formulas. The reason we use tools like Excel and other ones out there is computers are really good at doing things 
quickly and repetitively and reliably for the most part. And we want to use that power so we're not having to do that stuff over and over again. It's going to make things quicker and easier for us. So there's two ways to put a formula in. One is that you can go up here into the, uh, the formula selector here. Here are some of the common things that people do with data in Excel. They're right there for you. And there's a whole bunch more things that are buried underneath there. You notice right here are our friends max and min, which is what we want to use. So you can select from the formula bar up there and all the formulas in Excel follow a really standard format or syntax. A formula starts with an equal sign and then there's the name of the formula and whatever you're going to put in there goes in between these two parentheses. In this case, you could give it any random set of numbers you want and it would tell you what the smallest one is, but we want to tell Excel to look for the minimum in a given column. And so you select in between your um, parentheses here and then you can select an entire column just by clicking on the very top like this. And you'll notice that Excel has put this in here for us. And it says B colon B, which means B to B, which is essentially all of column B, find me the minimum number. And it tells us six, which we already knew was the case, which is great. Guess what? Max is really similar. And you can also just type a formula and you don't have to go select it up there. So in this case, you can start guessing, right, at how formulas work and what the language and the syntax is. You start to develop some fluency with that. So we're going to pick the max for this column, and that's going to tell us that it was 432, which if we recall, we'll go back and, well, we don't have it sorted that way anymore, so I can't do that. Um, and then what we'll do is the minimum tenancy. So back here to min again, min, we're going to go to this column, six again, and here's our max, and we're going to go max for this one. And that gives us 240. So as you get a bit more fluent with Excel or even other tools, you'll start to be able to build in scripts and other ways to sort of repeat these kinds of exercises if you do them over and over again. Let's do one more before we're done. And then we're going to move on to generating some more descriptive statistics for this. Let's look at that smoke alarm value. Now if we select our data and we sort by smoke alarm, we can do a visual inspection really quickly and we can see that actually there's not really very many, right? We can see here there's five and so that's a really small percentage. But if you had say a big data set and you had a lot of values like this, you wouldn't want to be sorting and trying to go through and hand count all of this. Obviously, Excel can do this for us as well. So let's use the count if function and we're going to count how many are without a smoke alarm? So the countif function, you, there's a bunch of count functions actually, and you'll notice now, it, it was doing this before when I was typing in, you might have noticed. As I start to type equals in some kind of function name, Excel starts guessing at what I might want to do. Now, if I've used a function before, it will suggest that one to me again. What you'll notice here is that there's a number of different kinds of counting functions in Excel. You can count just how many blank cells there are, just how many cells there are. In this case, we have a conditional count. We want to know if there are, how many if there are false and how many if there are true. And so we're going to choose this count if function and it asks for a range and a criteria. Now the range is our smoke alarm column. So we're going to put that in and then the criteria is whether it's true or false. And in this case, when you're working with a value, a, um, a text value like this, you actually need to put quotes around it. And so we're going to say, count if in column D, how many are false? And that's five. We knew from visual inspection that was true. And then you can actually do the same thing again. We're going to count if in our column D, how many are true? And that's gonna give us the remainder of those. So this is just a quick tour of how to get Excel to do some really basic kinds of um, descriptive stats for your data. Like I said, you can start to script these things. You can have these things just be repetitively sort of generated for you. And that's going to help you move along you know, in your analysis more quickly. So what we're going to do now in the next video is start building up some of the more typical descriptive statistics that are going to help you inform the model that you're going to be building for your analysis. So let's move on to that.